What made King Charles cry this week? What's behind William's controversial intervention in the Middle East? And is Harry now trying to use the media to work his way back into the royal family? We have a fascinating show coming up for you. And welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Sarah Vine, standing in for Joe Elvin, hence the unfashionable appearance. Joining me today is the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, and the paper's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome to you both. Um, a reminder to all our viewers that if you like great royal videos every week, then please make sure you press that subscribe button and never miss another episode. So we have so much to talk about this week. Rebecca, let's kick things off uh, with an emotional update on the King. Tell us, tell us about that. Yeah, I welled up slightly actually when I heard this. So obviously the King is coming back into London every week for yeah. treatment and to have meetings. And this week he had his first face-to-face -face meeting, the first audience of the year and since his cancer diagnosis with our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. And unusually we had cameras there mm. because they don't normally do it because his meetings are meant to be private. Mm. But obviously they're very concerned to make sure the King is still being seen to be well enough mm. to be doing his job. And, and he mentioned to the Prime Minister that he'd received so many wonderful cards and messages of mm. support that they made him cry half the time. And I was like, oh, you know, you forget actually amongst all of this, he really is going I know, and it is experience. it is an emotional thing, isn't it? Mm. I mean, uh, Richard, you, you'd be forgiven thinking that he would just sort of hide out at Sandringham and, and not, you know, not just come for his treatment and then rush back, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, the natural thing yeah. would have been, you know, if any of us, um, you know, had this sort of treatment, you'd want to just go and just recuperate yeah. and take it easy. Yeah. But he, he is coming back each week, yeah. and so he's kind of using that opportunity to carry out some engagements yeah. at the same time. I think the palace is clearly very keen to show that he's still in charge. Mm. You know, that's why we saw the video of him mm. meeting the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, mm. and you know, sort of keen to show that everything is still still <laughs> sort working, of still going functioning. On but why do you, why do you think he's going backwards and forwards to Sandringham? I and mean, wouldn't he stay at in London or in Windsor? I mean, it's it's quite a long journey for someone who's is, not very well, and they have to fly by helicopter, which is quite. Quite worrying, I yeah. think. Yeah, I mean, generally, um, Clarence House, you know, is mm. his London residence, but it's a sort of place where he is for work. So mm. Sandringham is where he goes to recuperate. And mm. as anyone who's had this sort of treatment will know, it's, it's gruelling and mm. he, he can just relax, take it easy. There are no pressures at all mm. in Norfolk. Mm. Um, but it does mean, yes, that he's travelling, you know, each week there and back. And I hear it's generally by a helicopter, mm. which I must admit sends a sort of shiver down my spine because helicopters are very really dangerous. dangerous. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're the king or mm. not, but you know, it, it's a very dangerous thing. And it's, it's not just the king, it's also um, William, Catherine and their whole family do travel from what I've heard together in a helicopter mm. to Sandringham when they go to Anmer mm. Hall for their weekends away or their week away for half term. And you know, that, that does worry me. I think Queen Elizabeth was always very nervous about, yeah. you know, in the case of Prince George, Prince William, you've got two future kings mm. travelling together. Personally, I, I think, you know, Queen Elizabeth always wants to make sure you've got to travel separately. Uh, that's a very good point, because, of course, the thing is, the person waiting in the wings were things to go catastrophically wrong in a helicopter would be Harry. I mean, Rebecca, that would be quite seismic. Yes, I mean, if they all got, I mean, obviously, if anything happened to William, Prince George would be the heir to the throne, yeah, but, but they would have a Charles regency. Yeah, but if you've got Charles and Camilla but if, but and if, William and the kids mm. in the same... I'd, I'm not sure that's a very good idea. Why no, and, and I, as Richard Wright, he mm. said the late, the late Queen Elizabeth was, was mm. very anxious about those things. I mean, I remember going out years ago to South Africa to mm. cover when William and Harry went out to do a motorbike event on there, and they didn't even travel together on the same commercial aircraft, mm. um, they each took different aircraft to get there, such was the concern about them being on the same flight, because mm. obviously neither of them had children at that point, and they were, you know, in the direct, both direct heirs to the throne at that point. I think the, the problem is, you know, Prince William's a very keen environmentalist. He doesn't mm. want to, you know, waste fuel, and imagine the idea of having two helicopters is... You might be worried about, you know, bad what headlines or whatever. What about the royal train? There is a royal train that goes up to King's Lynn, yeah. isn't there? And it's a two-hour train journey. I mean, it's a much safer, much more environmentally friendly Yeah, we often used to transport. see images, photographs of Queen Elizabeth mm. boarding that train. Mm. Uh, well, I think often it wasn't the royal train, it was no, just a regular a one. one yeah. um, so, you know, I would say, you know, if, if the Prime Minister needs to have a word, mm. say, look, 
use the train or travel yeah. separately. No helicopters yeah, guys, together. Don't please. travel together. <laughs> travel separately, please, because, you know, we're worried about you. Um, moving on, there were some great pictures this week of William at the BAFTAs, but tinged perhaps the little sadness as he was on his own, all on his Todd without Catherine. It was really striking because mm. he's president of BAFTA, um, which is the, the film TV organisation, mm. and it was always a great occasion to dress up. You'd mm. have him and Catherine looking super yeah, glamorous. Yeah, some sort of shimmery uh, kind of, you know, gold number. She yeah. always looks amazing. And she would sort of outshine mm. all those stars that would be there on the mm. red carpet and everything. And I, I think, you know, this year, Obviously, he was on his own, and it, I, I think he did suffer a bit because of that. He he admitted in some of the conversations with the actors and actresses that you know he hadn't seen as many films as he normally mm. does, and that's I think he was saying a lot of the time he would be watching them with Catherine, but this year he's had other preoccupations mm. with her surgery and that mm. sort of thing. So um, you know, I think some of the conversations were, were a bit stilted I mean, this year. It's, it's interesting, Rebecca, how much she carries him. Well, she certainly adds a sense yeah. of you know, of glamour uh, to the proceedings, especially something like a, a black tie event. Yeah. Let's face it, if we're really honest, I mean, William, I think, does a great job, but we all want to see what the <laughs> ladies of the family are there looking like and wearing. And, yeah. you know, Catherine wears, you know, particularly mind-blowingly good evening mm. dresses. Mm. I don't think any other member of the royal family kind of holds a candle to her no, in that respect. No, her evening so dress game you, is you do, very you, good. You, you know, you do miss that, I have mm. to say. Oh, well, it's not long now, hopefully, before we see <laughs> Catherine again. A few more weeks to wait. Yes, hopefully. Yeah. Rebecca, uh, on to slightly more serious territory. We had an unexpected uh, intervention this week from William mm. on Gaza. Um, what did you make of that? Well, it was interesting because I was with him on mm. that day. He was visiting the British Red Cross and I got a heads up that uh, he was planning to put out a statement, which mm. was quite unexpected. Uh, because I was going to be with him, I wouldn't be able to react and inform my news desk in the way I would normally do. And I was told it was going to be pretty punchy, was the word used, but I didn't realise quite how punchy it was going to be until I saw it. Um, it's obviously quite unprecedented and really quite extraordinary uh, to make those statements involving a, a live conflict in that way. And obviously something that it is as problematic uh, politically and is so polemicised as, as the Middle East. I think we're all quite taken aback. I yeah. mean, the result... Remind think, us what he actually said. Just, you know, can you just I mean, give he, us that? He was obviously very much stressing that he was coming from a humanitarian point mm. of view. And I think we've got real echoes of his late mother mm. there on the issue of landmines, for example. Um, but he was saying he, he, he wanted to see an end to the killing in Gaza. Uh, he said too many lives had been lost as a result of the conflict. Uh, that's followed on since those horrendous terror attacks of October mm. the 7th. Um, he was saying more aid needs to get into Gaza. He was also making the point that uh, Hamas need to release the remaining Israeli hostages they've got. Mm. So he was trying to kind of balance both sides of, mm. of the equation. Um, there there were, have been some people who've been very critical of him and mm. saying, look, this is not a member of the royal family's job, however well-meaning. Interestingly, I don't think he's got as much quite as much criticism as some people might have expected. And, and Israel, the Israeli embassy in London, gave quite a careful and quite diplomatic response, saying we've really appreciated the support he's shown to our country over the years by visiting it and the strong statements mm. he gave after October the 7th. But it but, is nevertheless you know, an intervention, which, which is a departure from how for example, the late Queen probably would have managed the situation. The, the late Queen and possibly even the previous Prince of Wales, I'm yeah. not sure, I know he was outspoken on a lot of things, I'm not sure King Charles mm. would have waded in mm. to that situation And also, Richard, way. it's quite interesting because I think the timing was particularly uh, tricky because we had this vote in uh, Parliament this week on a ceasefire. So do you think, I mean, do you think in that respect it was a wise intervention or would you know, do you feel it? Do you feel it? Because well, I think the one thing William needs to be very careful about is is being seen to try to influence, you know, democratic parliamentary processes. Well, our colleague Richard Kay wrote a very interesting piece this week where he was, you know, highlighting that that criticism and, and the contrast with what he thinks, you know, Queen Elizabeth would have done. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the key point was it was humanitarian, it wasn't a political mm. intervention. That's what everyone has been keen to stress. Mm. And so we've seen that it was supported by the chief rabbi, mm. 
um, by the British Board of Deputies. So, you know, he, he didn't antagonise anyone with the intervention. Mm. But the fact that it was the day before a, a Commons vote, mm. which, um, you know, to explain to our viewers overseas, it was a, a, a vote in the House of Commons which was highly controversial and actually became very yeah. acrimonious indeed. So, you know, the timing, particularly with hindsight, it is difficult, but it's yeah. clearly something he felt very strongly about, as mm. lots and lots of people do, and, and he want, wanted to voice those humanitarian concerns. I mean, Rebecca, who's advising him at the moment? Well, he's obviously got his private office, his, mm. his private secretary, who's actually going to be going back into Whitehall very mm. soon. We're waiting to see the new appointment in his place. But he also had his new foreign office advisor there, a man called David Hunt, who's got more than 21 years um, mm. diplomatic experience. I think he was ambassador to Lithuania and he's basically on secondment with mm. William as an assistant private secretary but very much advising on foreign affairs and mm. he was there by his side throughout that Red Cross uh, meeting. I mean I think it's quite I think it's quite interesting that uh, when he was turned 40 almost two years ago now, I wrote a big kind of three-part mm. profile on William for the mayor, which I think you can still find online about who he is, what makes him tick, mm. the man who will be king. And actually some really well-placed sources at the time said to me, and you know, the words are still there in, in black and white, that I think he will be more outspoken than people yeah. think he will be. Not, not on everything, yeah. on, but on the things that really matter to yeah. him, he, he will not be able so to not speak out. So do you think this is a sort of, you know, this is a, a taste of things to come in terms I, of I his do, involvement? I, I do, but I, I mean, I wouldn't expect it on, a, on everything. Um, mm. But I think on the subjects that really matter to him, and someone I, I, I trust and I really value their opinion said to me that William very strongly feels that the time of Queen Elizabeth never complaining, never mm. explaining, it is. is probably not enough in the modern age and there mm. may be times that he needs to explain where the monarchy sits mm. in the bigger picture mm. of world events and clearly I think that was quite prophetic because this is this is one of them. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, some people might feel it's quite brave for him to intervene on such a contentious issue because, you know, mm. It is a very, very thorny issue. Well, having seen just even making posts about what he said this yeah. week on social media, yeah. probably the same for you, Richard, I've got bombarded with yeah. very strong opinions on, yeah. on either side. It is a very polemic issue. Yeah. Well, we'll have to watch this space. Um, if you enjoy this programme, you might enjoy another show from the Mail. It's called The Reaction, and it's hosted by me and uh, my colleague Andrew Pierce. Every Wednesday, we bring you our opinions on the big weeks, uh, the week's big stories, and there's always a royal one in there. I should warn you, however, our opinions are not for the faint heart. So come and join us. I'm much tamer on this than I am on that. So do come and join us on The Reaction on the Daily Mail YouTube channel every Wednesday. There'll be a link in the description below. Now, we had more than 4,000 comments on last week's show. Thank you so much to all of you for writing in. Please keep them coming. We'll stay with Hayley C, who has this to say. I was watching The Crown last night and it struck me how much loss William has had to endure. His mother's death, his grandparents' death, his brother's betrayal, the loss of his brother in his family, his father's and wife's medical issues. It is horrific for one person to contend with. He needs praise rather than judgment. I think he is doing a wonderful job holding it all together. Rosemary Monty wrote in about the Sussex's visit to Canada. We'll be discussing that in just a moment, so stick around. She says, as a Canadian, I am sick of Harry and Meghan. Most Canadians are not happy with their antics for the past three years. We do not want to be linked to them at all. After Richard Kay made the point last week that if the King stripped the Sussexes of their titles, then Meghan would become Princess Henry. Not sure she's going to go for that. Caroline Owens writes in with the question, if the Queen of Denmark removed the Prince title from her second son, why can't Harry's be removed? So therefore, no Princess Henry. Rebecca, can you tell us, please explain why? Well, thanks for always throwing me the curveball, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Look, theoretically, it could happen. I mean, the king has the ability to issue letters um, patent, which, uh, sorry, patent, I always pronounce this wrongly. Patent uh, is the shoe. Is the shoe. Oh. Patent is the letters, which is basically the written expression of the king's will. Mm. And, and they can do it. And we saw, for example, Queen Elizabeth do that when she wanted to change around primogeniture. So mm. if 
William and Kate's firstborn child had been a girl, then she wouldn't have been pushed down the, yeah. the pecking order like her own daughter, Princess Anne. So they can do it. But it's almost kind of immaterial, I think, because mm. the one thing that has been stressed to me by, by my contacts all the way through the whole Harry and Meghan saga is that Charles, whatever his son has put him through, does love him, his son. He doesn't want to publicly humiliate him, which mm. is why they cannot conceive of a situation where he would ever consider stripping him of any title, mm. either a title he's entitled to by birth, or one such as the dukedom that was given to him by, by the Queen, mm. the late well, Queen. that's good to know. Must make Harry feel quite safe. Um, meanwhile, a very naughty comment comes in from Courtney Gear, who writes that she would love a montage of just Harry and Catherine having fun and giggles together and include William in some. It would really get to me gain. I can't promise that, but I can promise a very fun montage this week. Stick to the end for that one. Let's get back to my panel now. Rebecca, a couple of days uh, after the last episode of this, Harry gave quite a surprising interview. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so he and Meghan were out, as we know, in, in Canada, mm. launching one year to uh, the Invictus Winter Games. And he brought along a camera crew with him from GMA, one of the, well, probably is the biggest. Good morning, America. Yeah, I, biggest... As a tiny aside, <laughs> I noticed that the person interviewing him was the son of Superman, yeah. Christopher yes. Reeves. That's where yeah. son Will yeah. Reeves, yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry, um, that's a totally random. And, and he came along and followed it. So as soon as, I, as soon as people on the ground saw him there, they realised something was up. And lo and behold, there was this very, very heavily trailed interview with Harry. Actually, the interview was was only a kind of a few questions, mm. but the questions were were you know loaded. It was they wanted to know how the king was, why Harry flew. Uh, you know, to spend just 25 hours, you know, in the country and mm. only a matter of minutes with his father. And there was, you know, as any good journalist would do, they threw in a question about uh, could they see something as, as, as awful as a cancer diagnosis, healing the family rift and, and bringing them together. All, of course, are questions which our members of the royal family have uh, stayed very much away from answering in public and have mm. just, you know, left what they've got to say to the bare minimum uh, that we need to know about their health. Um, and Harry did look very uncomfortable, I have to say, and tried to kind of bat them off. But this is where he has made a rod for his own back, because over the years he has proved, whether it be for money or revenge or for whatever other reason, he is willing to talk about his family's most intimate details. Mm. And if he wants to get that kind of big airtime, prime airtime, even for such a good cause as Invictus, they are going to expect him to sing for his supper mm. now. Mm. So he, he's, he's made his bed and unfortunately he's going to have to lie in it. I mean, Richard, you think Harry can't surprise us in an interview, but do you think on this occasion he did? My goodness. I mean, yes, you think this is his first interview for mm. more than a year. He gave that series of interviews to publicise his um, memoirs, Spare, and also the Oprah one where he'd been criticising his family, he'd been saying the most appalling things about his family. And there he is now, a year later, talking about how much he loves his family mm -hmm. and how, um, you know, his father's cancer diagnosis can help bring them together. I mean, it's just, it's just seems I mean, a real sort of rank hypocrisy, really. How much do you think this is to do with the fact that they're slightly running out of road in America? Uh, this um, is what really comes across yeah. to me, is that you know, his father's unwell, he's been mm. diagnosed with cancer, and, you know, Harry may have lim limited time with his father, it's mm. just a fact. Mm. And so he seems to be now desperately trying mm. to mend those fences. We've seen it before, you know, on the King's birthday, but now this has made it all the more urgent. Mm. And he's desperate. He talked about how he's going to be coming over to Britain more to try and see his father, and he's keeping in touch, and he really wants to reinstate that link, and that link is his bread and butter, frankly. I mean, look, you know, he gives he an interview. Quite literally, it is he, his He's bread there and butter. to yeah. promote Invictus in Canada, mm. but they're not asking him about Invictus, really. Mm. What they're, they're asking him about is his relation with the royal mm. family. That's just the way things are, and mm. he, he is taking advantage of that. And Rebecca, what do you think about the notion of him coming back into the fold and doing some royal duties, which was something that was mooted? Not a hope in hell, <laughs> simply. I mean, it was a, it was a, there was a story on the front page of the Times newspaper mm. last Saturday, which appeared to me to be very heavily briefed by mm. Harry's side of the equation, mm. whether it was done with or without his knowledge, we don't know, mm. but effectively saying he would be 
keen to come back and step into the into the uh, into the fray and do, undertake more royal duties while his father was ill and obviously Princess of Wales is is not well either. Um, it also seemed to suggest that there was a kind of tacit support for the idea here. Now that immediately from rung the al palace. yeah from the palace mm. that immediately rung alarm bells with me because I I just know that mm. is not their thinking and I made some calls and was told very quickly. Absolutely not. There has been not even a casual conversation mm. about that here. That we very strongly believe from this side of things that the King, the Prince of Wales, and actually all of the family believe that Sandringham Summit, the results of that still remain, where Queen mm. Elizabeth made clear, very, very clear her view that he could not have a half in and half out role. And if he was going to live in America and pursue commercial opportunities, good luck to him. But that it meant he could not be a working member yeah. of the royal family. I mean, it's not as simple changed. as just coming back and doing a couple of shifts. I mean, yeah. it's, you can't just plug back into something like the royal family. No, especially given what's happened over no. the years. Obviously, no one predicted at that Sandringham summit Harry would go on to, to mm. do what he subsequently mm. did. Richard, what was perhaps surprising was that there were quotes from both sides confirming the story. Yeah, I mean, this was in this Times report that, mm. um, that broke the story. Mm. And I think that the, the dilemma is that the king does... You know, he, he does want a reconciliation mm. with, with Harry. That's the mm. thing. So, you know, particularly with his illness, you know, he, he does welcome that. But you've got all the pressure of the, the palace and the courtiers and no one wants that Sandringham agreement to be broken. No. So I think it's tricky. But, I mean, certainly what I've written in my newsletter this week mm. is that um, Harry has been given a taste of what to expect when his brother is king. And mm. that's very mm. cold, you know, that yeah. he... You know, it, William will veto any yeah. um, return, yeah. any official duties by Harry. That's just not going to happen. No. Uh, and so it's, I think he's already sort of feeling yeah. that chill. Yeah. Now to a story by our colleague Alison Boshoff, uh, questioning the um, solidity of uh, Harry's deal with Netflix. Yes, Alison Boshoff is Daily Mail's chief mm. show business writer, and she's been delving into um, Netflix mm. and speaking to people there. Um, and what, what she found fascinating about, you know, last week on this programme, they talked about the, the relaunch of um, Harry and Meghan's website. Mm. And what um, Alison. Sussex.com. Sussex mm. And what Alison noted mm. was that there's not a single mention of Netflix. Mm. So it's really notable because they mention. Everything um, else. Yeah, well, they mention the yeah. projects that were made by Archwell Productions yeah. in collaboration with Netflix. Mm. But they don't mention Netflix at all. Mm. Now, Alison sort of takes that as a strong hint mm. that that deal may be coming to an end. Mm. You know, I think it ends. Um, next year or the end yeah. of this year, that it's unlikely to be renewed. Certainly that's the impression she gets. And they're already preparing for that. We know the Spotify deal ended for the podcasts, and um, Megan you know, announced recently a deal with a, a tiny company that you know, we weren't really aware of. Called Lemonade? I yeah. Think. And, Lemonade. And so yeah. Lemonade. They've gone from Spotify, you know, the audio giant, to a tiny mm. company. Yeah. So you know, certainly Alison <coughs> Boshoff thinks, mm. th thinks things are not all well there. Yeah, I mean, if they don't have their Netflix and they don't have their Spotify, what are they going to do? Well, I think that's as well might help explain why we've got this urgency about renewing I mean, those, yes. those royal links. Yes. yes. Rebecca, if that were to go, presumably they'd have to find something else to fund their expensive Montecito lifestyle. Absolutely. I mean, they've got security that costs yeah. them millions a year. They've still they they bought that massive mansion on a mortgage, like like the rest of us buy our homes. Except theirs is kind of nine million or yeah. something like that. Um, you know, they've got huge outgoings, mm. and and that takes serious amount of money uh, to keep that lifestyle afloat. Yeah. I mean, I would urge people to have a look at Alison Boshoff's article which is online mm. because it is a really good read it's really mm. well researched mm. she's um, very good Alison. really well yeah. sourced and it is very illuminating and Richard do you think it would be cheeky to suggest that uh, you know Harry might think that another royal gig might generate some more cash 
Oh, definitely. I mean, that's, um, well, generate royal cash in the sense he's not going to get paid to carry out no, royal but, duties. Well, would he get, I mean, would he get paid if he came but, back and started to work for the royals? Would he get... Well, I, I guess he'd, he'd get, get expenses stuff, for his, yeah, yeah. his duties. But, but, I mean, look, if the king said, yes, I would like you to help out, yeah. you could carry out some engagements perhaps yeah. overseas with the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. yeah. that sort of thing. Obviously, he wouldn't be paid for that, but it would be great in terms of no, securing his next deal. Look, we've seen him in Canada this week. Yeah. What does he do? He takes a film crew with yeah. him. Yeah. So, you know, he could have a film crew yeah. accompanying him on yeah. his royal duties. Yeah. And but, Rebecca, you talk about the mortgage. I mean, the thing is, if they couldn't pay their mortgage in Montecito, they could always come back to Royal Lodge. Uh, no, what was it called? Frogmore. Which Frogmore. They don't, well, well, which is empty at the moment, unless Prince Andrew eventually <laughs> decides to move in. I mean, they would... The trouble is, can you imagine how awkward that would be? I mean, it, it would know, be quite awkward, that's, yes. that's But they're not going to be living in a cardboard box. Oh, no, they'll never be living in a cardboard <laughs> box. But, I mean, the one thing to come about, the, the money situation, and, and they obviously when Harry left, he tried to make out that he'd been cut off penniless, um, which none yeah. of us believed at the time. And, of course, when the royal accounts came out that year, it was quite clear within the then Duchy of Cornwall accounts, which is was the then... King Charles' then Prince of Wales's pot of money, it was quite clear that he'd been paying or covering their, their upkeep to the yeah. tune of several million pounds yeah. a year. Now, that did stop because he said, I want to go yeah. and, you know, carve my own yeah. way. So he obviously hasn't got that safety blanket of daddy's money to come back to unless Charles was so kind as to <clears> give it to him. I again. mean, do you think there's a sense that people are sort of starting to realise that? Because they were sort of there were lots of cheers when they went when he went to Canada, but there were a few boos as well, weren't there? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I was off last week, but obviously I saw a lot of commentary, so I did listen to the video. Mm. I'm not sure I heard lots of boos. Mm. I mean, you know, I'm into my 50s, my hearing might be, might be failing me. But people who also watched it were convinced they could hear some. Mm. Um, and obviously Canada, the, the king, King Charles, is their head of state, and mm. obviously Queen Elizabeth was their much-loved head of state mm. for 70 years. So I can imagine there are a lot in Canada mm. who are very pro-monarchy and not particularly happy with Harry and Meghan's mm. behaviour. Well, I'll certainly be years. interested to hear from our viewers in Canada. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. please, if you're yeah. in Canada, let us know what you think. Uh, moving on, uh, the Duchess of Kent is not someone we hear an awful lot about, but you've written about her today. Yeah, it was, it was great to write about um, the Duchess because she turns 91 today, Thursday, and um, she's... Okay. Tell us, uh, just very boringly, because I'm not very yeah. good at this, what's her relation so, to the royal family? Um, Catherine um, Worsley, as she was, yeah. Yorkshire woman, married to the Duke of Kent, who was one of Queen Elizabeth's first cousins. Right. Um, so she turns 91 today. Um, she, is, she is frail, mm. um, but you can see she's still very enthusiastic and one of her um, you know, great interests and passions is music. Mm -hmm. She's been a music teacher herself and she founded a charity to try and encourage um, the next generation of musicians. Mm. And what the story is in, in my social diary today is that she's got two charities she's associated with to come together to nurture a new sort of wave of um, musical talent. Classical music um, talent. Yes, classical yeah. singing. Yeah. And um, it's j just very cheering story. So well, great I mean, to at 91, to still be doing stuff like that. That's quite <laughs> She's impressive. She's still working. They yes. certainly don't make them like that anymore. Rebecca, to my favourite royal, Princess Anne. Um, who I think really should just be running everything. Um, she, uh, she, William's comments on the Middle East, she's about to make a, a journey too, isn't she? She's off to Dubai next mm. week. Uh, it's, it's to do with the mission of seafarers, so I think probably less contentious yeah. territory. What is the mission of seafarers? Oh, it's an organisation. She's been patron of them for decades right. and decades. I remember writing about them when I did yeah. a profile for her for a 70s a few years ago, and they said she's been brilliant. Like, she comes to all the AGMs yeah. and in a very Princess yeah. Anne sort of way so she's off there I mean again only for a day and she's got engagements back mm. in the UK either side and actually just before we were about to come on air to film I got a message from the palace to say oh she's doing a job today she's going down to uh, save the children a charity shop that's celebrating its 10th anniversary in Wandsworth in South London if you're interested um, and here's a press release on it. So I think it just shows you the huge breadth of engagements that she does every week, from helping out at a charity shop in South London to, you know, yeah. being in Dubai. I mean, what is it about Princess Anne? Come on, Richard. <laughs> I mean, there just is something about her, isn't there? Well, I think it's, it's the no-nonsense yeah. aspect to her. And yeah. I, I think she embodies uh, all those things that lots of us value about the yeah. royal family, which yeah. is that sort of stoicism and getting on yeah. with it. And, and 
and that it's about public service. That's yeah. the key mm. thing. She's yeah. not some you know egomaniac who wants to talk about herself. It's all about yeah. what she can do to help others. Yeah. Yeah. There's quite a lot of Prince Philip in her, I always think. Definitely. Yeah. In fact, I, when I did the profile on her, I, I spent a day with her and it really made me realise how much she is like her father. Everyone yeah. thinks of the horses with her mother, yeah. but she's an engineering nut. Yeah. And she, we went round this, um, this kind of, it was like a water purification plant. She knew more about it than the people working mm -hmm. there and was quizzing them on stuff. She, she, yeah, I, I have to say, I think she's amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. there she is, amazing. After the success of last week's montage of candid shots of the royals, we decided to bring together some more sweet and hilarious pictures of the firm, this time with animals. You will love this. Is there a better combination? Hope you enjoyed that and the show. Joe and the team will be back next week. And there's just time to say thanks to Rebecca and Richard and to you for watching. Goodbye.